After the success of the Long Island Railroad Iceberg, I received several requests to make an iceberg video on various other railroads, especially nearby commuter railroads such as Metro North. Although, fearing that it wouldn't know enough information on these railroads, I decided to combine various facts on every Northeast commuter railroad into a single iceberg, but as I added more entries, I ultimately decided that there would be enough information to fulfill an entire iceberg on each commuter rail system alone. Since the previous iceberg covered Metro North, we'll be moving across the Hudson River into New Jersey, so we'll be taking a look into NJT's expansive history in commuter railroad, meaning that any non-commuter rail divisions of NJT including buses and light rail will not be included in this video. Also included in this iceberg are entries that include NJDOT during the time between operating other commuter systems in the late 60s and the official formation of NJT's commuter rail division in 1983 to include some more interesting topics that otherwise would have been excluded. So with all that out of the way, let's dive right into the New Jersey Transit Commuter Rail Iceberg. Company Origins the entire Northeast region used to have one of the most dense rail networks in the country, due to close proximity between towns, so it's fitting that each commuter agency in their respective regions has several predecessors. New Jersey Transit has the most diverse background, consisting of lines from five different original owners, as they can be split up into two divisions. The Hoboken Division covers all Erie and Lackawanna-owned lines that start from Hoboken, namely the Maine, Bergen County, and Pasco Valley lines, originally belonging to the Erie, and the Gladstone, Morristown, and Montclair Boonton lines, originally belonging to the Lackawanna. Meanwhile, the Newark division consisted of the other four lines that didn't originally terminate at Hoboken, namely the Raritan Valley line, once being owned by the Central Railroad of New Jersey, the Atlantic City line, once being owned by the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore lines, the Northeast Corridor line, once being owned by the Pennsylvania Railroad, and the North Jersey Coast line, once being jointly operated by the Pennsylvania and CNJ. Heritage Units these engines are existing locomotives that are given a wrap or paint scheme that pays tribute to a predecessor company that makes up the present day system. NJT started their heritage unit program for their 40th anniversary in 2019 by wrapping multi-level coaches in the mostly inaccurate liveries for the Pennsylvania, CNJ, Erie Lackawanna, PRSL, Conrail, and NJDOT, along with wrapped and painted engines representing the Pennsylvania, CNJ, Erie Lackawanna, NJDOT, and most recently, Erie. Veterans Units Several railroads across the United States have an engine or two that commemorates the service of veterans and the U.S. Armed Forces, although NJT could quite possibly roster the most veterans units on any active roster. Starting in the mid-2010s, a handful of ALP-46s and ALP-45s are given a banner on their side paying tribute to military members and veterans, but starting in 2022, six ALP-45s were given distinct banners that specifically highlight one of the six branches of the United States military. These six branches include the Space Force, Army, Marines, Navy, Coast Guard, and Air Force, in addition to a unique blue veterans unit, number 4502, that highlights all six branches. E-Units After serving three decades on a wide variety of passenger trains across the country, a handful of these legendary engines, specifically E-8s, eventually found their way to lighter commuter duties on NJ Dock. Most of these engines served their respective agencies well into the late 80s, and they were sold to private owners or scrapped, as one last hurrah for America's most iconic passenger engines. Lackawanna Cutoff Originally built as a bypass for the Lackawanna Railroad mainline in 1908, the new mainline, praised as an engineering marvel with the Delaware River Viaduct, ran between Port Morris, New Jersey and Scranton, Pennsylvania, as it was mostly abandoned in 1979 due to being a redundant mainline for Conrail while passenger service on the line ended years earlier before the formation of Amtrak. The Zeri Lackawanna was one of the handful of railroads that did not join Amtrak. Soon after its abandonment, various proposals were made to restore passenger service along the line to Scranton from Amtrak and other local groups, although the project was delayed for decades for various reasons, such as developing rail service to casinos in Atlantic City instead of the Poconos. As of now, New Jersey Transit is looking to restore service one stop to Andover, New Jersey as Phase 1, and eventually Scranton in Phase 2, while Amtrak is also looking into restoring passenger service on the exact same route between New York and Scranton, possibly in an attempt to bring forth service on the line faster than NJT. Mandated Pasture Variants That's right everyone, a Cal Unit Productions quote is now an official iceberg entry. Technically, the first mandated pasture variant for NJT is NJ.SU34CH, 
a passenger variant of the GE Universal series of freight diesels, which eventually went to NJT and Metro North. Now for the much more prevalent GP40 rebuilds. The GP40P was ordered by the CNJ in conjunction with NJDOT, and they were fitted with steam heaters for the coaches, with these Jeeps along with surplus GP40s from CSX being rebuilt by Morrison Knudsen into the GP40PH-2 for NJT in 1991, this time with head and power and dash 2 components. Some Jeeps were also rebuilt into the GP40FH-2, with cows from EMD F45s being placed behind the GP40 cab for NJT and Metro North, with all the NGT units being sold to various railroads across the country starting in the 2010s. Cab Car Smith Consist This isn't really uncommon per se, as cab cars are often sandwiched into the middle of larger consists based on how many cars are needed for each run, with such practice occurring at least once in a while on almost every commuter railroad. However, I decided to include this entry to specifically highlight a specific trend of NJT having a Comet 4 cab car directly behind the lead engine on every single level train. This is likely done as an extra space for the crew members to reside, or to be used as an extra car if needed. NJT 4877 In 1979, NJDOT repainted one of their inherited GG1s into its Tuscan red and gold livery as it was nicknamed Big Red and pulled several excursions both on and off NJT before its retirement with the rest of the class in 1983. Many people debate as to whether this engine is considered the first heritage unit, as the engine was painted into a livery of a predecessor railroad that no longer exists during its service on NJDOT and later NJT. Princeton Dinky This branch is a bit of a local legend for NJT, as it carries the tradition of providing a direct shuttle service from Princeton University to the Northeast Corridor at Princeton Junction. This line is also particularly interesting as it uses overhead electrification for a total of two stops, as it's the shortest commuter rail line in the country at just 2.7 miles long, even though it's technically considered a branch of the NJT Northeast Corridor line. Considering the short length of this peculiar branch line, there have been several proposals to convert the line into light rail or a dedicated bus route, with the final decision currently in the works, but most likely some sort of road and rail hybrid service as of when this video was made. Metro-North West of Hudson In addition to the three main lines from Grand Central, Metro-North also operates two lines out of Hoboken Terminal by using NJT trackage for at least half of the route, hence the West of Hudson designation. The two lines in question are the Pasquet Valley and Port Jervis lines, with Metro-North branding utilized for any services on the New York side of the service, and otherwise runs express along NJT mainline trackage, with mostly local runs along the Pasquet Valley line, since there are only three stops in New York along that route. Metro-North also has their own rolling stock, namely F40s, GP40s, and Comet coaches, that are intended to be used on these services, and are sometimes mixed in with existing NJT rolling stock, although this appears to be more prevalent on the Port Jervis line, since Metro-North owns a larger portion of that route. Secaucus Loop As one of many projects proposed by NJT for the past 20 years, this loop intends to directly connect the four Hoboken exclusive lines to the Northeast Corridor and into Penn Station. However, the existing stock cannot be utilized in the Penn Station with a loop, as the diesels used are too high for the Hudson River tunnels and will violate Penn Station's electric-only rule since the diesel fumes would spread throughout the station. Although, the existence of Secaucus Junction Transfer Station was more logical at the time, as NJT did not roster any dual-mode ALP45s that could use both diesel and overhead wires until about 10 years later, and that would result in a much larger order to replace most of the diesels on those four routes as well as defeating the purpose of a transfer station in the first place by providing direct service to the Penn Station instead of transferring from a Hoboken-bound train. Ricardo the Bold During the morning rush shower of December 14, 2023, a Texas Longhorn Bull escaped a nearby butcher and somehow got onto the Northeast Corridor as it started running around Newark Penn Station, subsequently halting all service for some time and causing delays to the tail end of the rush hour commute. This incident instantly went viral with several people taking videos of the bull running loose on the tracks through the station, until the bull was eventually tranquilized and safely taken to the Skylands Animal Sanctuary in Northern Jersey. Since then, NJT saw the opportunity to capitalize on the vital event, as well as helping out the animal sanctuary that the bull was transported to, as NJT announced the creation of a bull plus toy based on the event, as the bull was named Ricardo, with some of the proceeds going to the aforementioned animal sanctuary. Penn Station is the busiest station in North America. 
as one of the most iconic commuter rail stations in the Northeast, with its 21 tracks and three soon to be four different railroads serving the station, it should come as no surprise that New York's Penn Station is the most used station in North America, let alone the three railroads that it serves. Based on data from 2018, Penn Station sees over 107 million riders per year, or 294,000 riders per day, which places it well above second place, that being Toronto Union Station at 72 million riders annually, followed by Grand Central in New York City with 67 million riders annually. Bound Brook and Princeton Junction Two legendary rail fanning spots in the Northeast, both accessible by two legendary NJT lines. The first of these two spots isn't necessarily famous for NJT action with the Raritan Valley line, but rather for being at the intersection of the main lines of two Class 1s, namely Norfolk Southern and CSX, with frequent manifest and intermodal action with all kinds of freight engines rounding a series of curves, thus making for some great angles. Whereas Bound Brook is known for non-stop freight action, Princeton Junction offers non-stop passenger action with frequent NJT service with their iconic Princeton Dinky meeting their Northeast Corridor line all while Amtrak regionals, Acellas, and long-distance trains whisk by miles of straight track at top speeds of over 150 miles per hour, along with the occasional work train or equipment move. Both locations are two of the most iconic rail fanning spots in the entire Northeast, with thousands of rail fanning compilations at these two locations being uploaded to YouTube on an annual basis. ACES Despite the Atlantic City Line existing to provide direct rail service to its namesake city, service ends at Philadelphia and is not directly connected to the rest of the NJT system. Trying to connect more northern regions to the city on the sea, NJT introduced the Atlantic City Express Service, or ACES, in 2009, that provided direct express service between New York Penn Station and Atlantic City. As the service was operated by NJT and funded by the Casino Reinvestment Development Authority, with support from Borregata, Caesars, and Harris Casinos. The train only ran on Fridays and weekends, and consisted of four converted multi-level coaches with an ALP44 on one end for the electric portion of the route between Penn Station and Philly, and a P40DC for the diesel portion to Atlantic City, thus being the last stomping grounds for both kinds of engines since they've been long since retired on other duties. However, Aces fell victim to bad timing, as gambling away money at casinos was probably the last thing a lot of people wanted to do right after a recession in 2008, which ultimately led to the service being discontinued just two years after its start in 2011, with the multi-levels being converted back into standard coaches not too long thereafter. Shared Electric with Amtrak Almost all commuter services that run on the fully electrified Northeast Corridor share the usage of Amtrak's overhead electric wires for a fee. Specifically, Amtrak's electric runs at 25 Hz between DC and New York, 60 Hz between New York and New Rochelle, 12.5 Hz between New Rochelle and New Haven, which is owned by Metro North, and then 60 Hz between New Haven and Boston, which is the newest segment owned by Amtrak. Although each railroad off of the Northeast Corridor owns their own electrification system, a handful of former Pennsy lines have their electrification provided by Amtrak's 12 kV 25 Hz system instead of NJT's own X Lackawanna 60 Hz traction power system. These include the Princeton Shuttle and the North Jersey Coastline to Matawan on NJT, likely due to their close proximity to Amtrak trackage, even though Amtrak itself does not run on these lines. GP40-2 This is not a shortened version of the commonly seen GP40PH-2 or Dash 2B, but rather a smaller class of original GP40-2s that were purchased without any of the other modifications that certified the other rebuilt Jeeps for passenger service, as these four engines were limited to switching and MOW service for their entire careers, with the most notable difference being the rear radiators being flat instead of angled, thus following the more traditional GP40 styling. Like the rebuilt Dash 2Bs, these four engines were purchased from Conrail in 1993, but they were simply repainted into the same livery as the rebuilt Jeeps, as they were numbered from 4300 to 4303, as the first three were initially built for Penn Central, while the last one, 4303, was initially built for New York Central. NJT EQ Moves Once again, under normal circumstances, equipment moves aren't anything special on commuter railroads, as most of them usually involve moving sets from one yard to another for sketching purposes, and maybe an extra engine or coach or two for switching purposes. However, I have to give a special shout out to specifically NJT's equipment moves since every single one of them involves an incredible variety of coaches and engines that are usually never seen together on revenue consoles, 
These moves range from 2 to almost 20 units long, and sometimes even includes URHS and private cars. And thankfully, there's a bunch of footage of these amazing equipment moves all throughout the NJT system, especially the Northeast Corridor, as you never know how large or diverse the next equipment move will be. No NJT signage in Moynihan Train Hall. Well, this is an entry simply because NJT didn't pay for any part of the train hall, which is why even when NJT trains are on tracks that Moynihan Train Hall covers, they do not appear on the boards of the train hall, nor are there any NJT departure boards within the main train hall. Although, there is NJT signage on the overpass directly between the train hall and track level, as tracks that have the NJT trains on them do have NJT trains on the display board. NJT cab cars in front of engines. Since NJT was running behind schedule of December 31st, 2020 deadline to install positive train control, or PTC, across the system, NJT placed many of their cab cars, which had PTC installed, in front of ALP46s, which did not have PTC at the time. This way, trains could still run as scheduled even if the engine itself didn't have PTC, although these leading cab cars were not open to the public, which often resulted in complaints from commuters who wanted extra room on the trains. Interestingly, Two F40PH-2 cats were brought out of retirement to lead cabs that didn't have PTC installed on them on a few Hoboken Division trains in 2020, as F40s acted as replacement cab cars with a GP40 on the other end. Camaro Coach Slash Cab On the topic of single-level coaches, the term Camaro is derived from combining the words Comet and Arrow, since the Comet designation is usually reserved for cab cars, while the Arrow designation is reserved for multiple units. Therefore, Camaros are Aero MUs that are converted into Comet cab cars, as well as a play on words of the Chevy Camaro sports car. In a technical sense, there are two Camaros, the Comet 1A, which consists of 10 uncompleted Aero 3 shells from Avco and Canadian Vickers converted in 1978, only saw service on Metro North's Fourth Jervis line, while the Comet 1B consists of 30 Aero 1 EMUs that were converted into cab cars in 1980 that saw service on NJT's Hoboken division. Speaking of the latter of the two, Comet 1Bs on Caltrans. After being converted from Arrow 1 EMUs in the late 80s, these cab cars served NJT on Hoboken Division trains until 2008, and they are repainted and sold to Caltrans for service on Amtrak's San Joaquin's from Oakland to Sacramento and Bakersfield, California, along with a few surplus cars briefly going to AMT in Montreal. Even though this technically isn't an NJT entry per se, these ex-NJT cars seem to have a bit of a following in California, as their styling, including the orange and teal logo, closely resembles their livery on NJT. Nowadays, these cars can be found behind Siemens chargers on one end and an F40PH MPCU on the other, which are essentially F40s converted to baggage slash cab cars, although the days of these Comets are numbered, as they will soon be replaced by the Siemens Venture coaches and cab cars. SEPTA ALP46 Lease a handful of ALP46 Comet sets released by SEPTA along with a few ACS64s and marked single-level coaches in 2016 to supplement a fleet-wide outage of Silverliner 5s due to cracked stabilizer bars. Most of these replacement runs were in regions where these engines were qualified to run, specifically the Trenton line between Broad Street Station and Trenton, and plenty of footage of the supplemental equipment running on the Trenton line. Mark 4145 Mark purchased a GP40PH-2 directly from NJT in 2019, likely as a spare engine based on how infrequently it's in pasture service. But instead of simply repainting this engine into the pre-existing livery found in the GP39s, the shop workers decided to create a variation of the Mark and NJT liveries by repainting the right two stripes of the NJT Disco stripe into a light blue, while leaving the orange as is, in order to match the Mark colors while keeping part of its NJT identity thus resulting in a unique and somewhat cursed combination of the two railroads from two states. Mom Corridor Over the past 20 years, NJT has been developing three alignments for service to Lakehurst in the better serve Ocean County, namely the Monmouth Ocean Middlesex Line, or the Mom Corridor. From left to right, the Monmouth Junction alignment involves turning off the Northeast Corridor at Monmouth Junction and following former Penzi present-day Conrail and Delaware and Raritan River trackage to Lakehurst, the Matawan alignment involves restoring the now abandoned CNJ branch between Matawan and Freehold before joining the Monmouth Junction alignment. And lastly, the Red Bank alignment that follows the XCNJ now Delaware and Raritan River trackage straight down to Lakehurst, 
although there isn't any projection date for any of these lines since the project has been on and off, I feel the last of these alignments might be completed first, since it involves the least amount of track restoration, and perfectly follows the former CNJ mainline to Lakehurst, which used to continue further south to Atlantic City, and serve the famous Blue Comet. Bayonne Shuttle This is cutting it pretty close since NJT itself wasn't formed until 1979, and this service was discontinued one year prior in 1978, but it thankfully falls under the state agencies before the official railroad count rule, hence why it's included. Technically, this service was inherited from the CNJ just before NJDOT inherited their commuter operations, but basically, as a result of the CNJ relocating their passenger service from Communipal Terminal to Newark Penn Station in 1967, they provided a shuttle service along their now former main line along most of the route between Cranford and Bayonne 34th Street. This shuttle was most well known for two-car RDC consists, with engine hall consists occasionally being used as well, but the shuttle suffered from extremely low ridership and relatively high prices, as most riders were railroad workers going to the Elizabethport shops. The service was eventually discontinued in 1978, as the CNJ mainline east of Cranford became overgrown and abandoned. The bridge over Newark Bay was demolished, and a trackage in Bayonne was later converted into the present-day Hudsonburg and Light Rail. Lackawanna Terminal Montclair. This station was initially the grand terminus of the electrified Montclair branch of the Lackawanna Railroad that would eventually be inherited by NJT under NJDOT. But its use under NJT wouldn't last for long, as service would be relocated to the adjacent Bay Street in 1981 in anticipation of connecting the branch to the Boonton Line for better service to Northern Jersey. Meanwhile, the original terminal building was converted into a mall, but is currently in danger of being demolished even though there are some calls to restore the terminal for passenger rail use with the development of new high-rise apartments nearby. In a way, I feel that Montclair Terminal is a bit of a mini Reading Terminal, in which an electrified terminus was abandoned and turned into a mall due to being bypassed for a through-running route, which I feel is kind of interesting seeing that this station shut down just three years before Reading Terminal was built. Abandoned ALP-44s in Stanhope, New Jersey this storage line became famous among urban explorers with several Arrow 3s and essentially the entire roster of NJT's ALP-44s stored on a single track. They've been sitting in the same place for roughly 10 years and have been subject to vandalism, and parts being stolen over time, which all the more added to their abandoned appearance. Yet, the track that they sit on leads right to the former Lackawanna Cutoff, which is planned to be restored by both NJT and Amtrak, so it is unknown where these ALP-44s will be moved next or whether they have a future at all. Trans-Regional Express In 2018, the Regional Plan Association, or RPA, an agency who has been known to propose various service improvements for passenger rail in the New York region, announced their newest proposal known as Trans-Regional Express, or T-Rex. This plan proposed to merge the Long Island Railroad with Metro North and New Jersey Transit, as well as converting lesser-used branch lines into light rail service and introduce entirely new lines, such as the route from Bronx down 3rd Avenue in Manhattan and connecting to Atlantic Terminal Brooklyn, known as the Manhattan Spine, and a loop from Hoboken to North Bergen via the Manhattan Spine, known as the Jersey Loop. As grand as this proposal is, there has been no direct news of this project's development since its announcement in 2018 as of when this video was made. Train to the Game During the late 2000s and early 2010s, Metro North partnered with NJT to host direct service to the recently opened Meadowland Station, not just on the Hoboken Division lines, but all the way to New Haven for a service known as Train to the Game. For this service, NJT train sets would be used to transport passengers from a handful of stations along the New Haven line to Secaucus Junction, with the train stopping at Penn Station for a crew change rather than disembarking, where they would later transfer the diesel shuttles to Meadowland Stadium to catch late afternoon football games on Sundays. Although there isn't too much footage of these moves, it marks the only instance of any NJT equipment being utilized was the sunny side, as the overhead wires provided direct service along three different electrified systems, and is technically the only example of commuter through running through Penn Station. Amtrak Thanksgiving Extra Often overshadowed by the Christmas season, the Thanksgiving traveling season usually results in overcrowded trains with friends and family traveling across the country to meet for Thanksgiving dinner. To help relieve the congestion on the busiest corridor in the country during this brief season, Amtrak often leases extra commuter coaches and engines from nearby commuter roads. Some years, Amtrak has even borrowed NJT Arrow 3s for these runs between New York and DC, but with the retirement of the HHP-8s, 
Amtrak usually uses their own HCS 64s to mark single levels, and now Amtrak simply runs more regular consists with Amfleets without having to borrow cars from other railroads, with the exception of a few Kings Hawaiian Rolls private cars lately. NJT Clocker Technically, the Clocker has always been an Amtrak service inherited from the Pennsylvania Railroad for local service between New York and Philly, but its relevance to the Iceberg starts in the 90s, when Amtrak started accepting NJT monthly tickets on the Clocker, which resulted in what's essentially an Amtrak-NJT partnership. Although, this entry in the Iceberg focuses on the last few years of the train's operation, where, in addition to accepting NJT ticket holders, Amtrak borrowed brand new ALP-46s from NJT the hall clockers between New York and Philly, thus being a rare instance of Amtrak and commuter equipment mixing in revenue service until the train was discontinued in 2005 and became various express trains for NJT, along with the NJT and SEPTA interagency pass until 2013. But during these few years, the ALP 46s were also in use during the existence of Club 200, a private car that required an exclusive membership to ride until 2002 as well as the Acela commuter branding until 2003, which technically made these NGT ALP 46s Acelas, at least when considering the early Acela brand and not the high-speed train sets. Jersey Shore Commuter Clubs In addition to club car service on the clocker, NGT also continued a club car tradition on their next most popular branch, the North Jersey Coastline. Established in 1933, the Jersey Shore Commuters Club would place an unsuspecting Comet 2 car with lounge chairs and fold-down tables and other club memorabilia, usually on the front of rush hour trains from Penn Station to Long Branch, with annual dues well over $1,000. Despite the luxurious interior starting with a PRR P70 coach, the club held its last run just before Hurricane Sandy in 2012 and disbanded shortly thereafter due to damage to the car, with a replacement luxury car conversion and new membership seeming unlikely. Hoboken Terminal Festival Similar to the National Train Day events was a series of local rail fests at Hoboken Terminal with rolling stock from NJT and several other local and visiting engines on display on a handful of tracks with other activities since 1982. Some of the many engines to visit the festivals include an Acela train set, Amtrak Celebrate the Century Express, Reading a Northern 425 and 2102, CNO 614, and even PA4 subway cars from past. Although rail fests haven't been an annual occurrence at Hoboken for some time, the terminal is still used for occasional displays, the most recent of which being for NJT's 40th anniversary in 2023, which would have also been Hoboken Festival 41. NJT trains faster than Amtrak During rush hour, there are certain express trains that solely focus on getting passengers who live further away to their destination fast, and without a bunch of local stops to prevent backup. Some of these rush hour trains have so few stops that they're in fact faster than some Amtrak trains that run along the same route by comparison, specifically Northeast Corridor Line trains that run express between Newark and Princeton Junction, while the first stop for Amtrak's Northeast Regional after Newark Penn is Newark Airport. Ben Franklin Station In 2005, the Philadelphia-based Pew Charitable Trust asked Amtrak to change the name of the 30th Street Station to Ben Franklin Station in honor of Benjamin Franklin and in celebration of Franklin's 300th birthday in January 2006. This name change would have affected signage for all railroads using the iconic terminal, but this idea faced criticism since it would be replaced in the name 30th Street Station, which is iconic in itself and provided a geographic marker for travelers. Furthermore, some claimed that Ben Franklin Station sounded too similar to Penn Station, which ultimately led to the proposed name change being cancelled in 2006, just a week after Ben Franklin's birthday on January 17th. Barrett of Allen Line to Allentown Years before Amtrak announced their proposal to run service on the RVL from Penn Station to Allentown, Easton Mayor Sal Panto Jr. promoted the restoration of passenger rail service to Easton or Phillipsburg, with possible extension to Bethlehem and Allentown. A study was made for such a service in 2010, but it didn't get too far, even though practically all the trackage is intact along the route, as Amtrak will thankfully be looking into the service as part of their Connexus plan. NJT SW9s Some engines are inherited from predecessors and are expected to either be in passenger service or work train service, while others are expected to remain on freight railroads. However, two freight engines that managed to hop onto NJDOT's roster include two SW9s, numbered 436 and 438, that mostly spent their time as Hoboken switchers. Originally built for the Erie in 1952, 438 was the first switcher to go to NJDOT in 1978, 
as it kept its Erie Lackawanna livery, but gained the NJDOT logo, as it was based in Elizabethport, before being repainted into the more well-known Bluebird livery two years later, around the same time as when the other SW9, 436, was acquired. After working for a few years in Hoboken Yards, both engines were donated to URHS, where 436 is currently in its as-built Erie livery, as part of the URHS collection in Boonton, while 438 is currently owned by the Black River and Western Taurus Railroad, where it operates daily excursions between Flemington and Ringo's. NJT GP9s Don't be fooled by the similar name and appearance, as these are not the same GP7s that were inherited from the CNJ for RVL commuter services, but rather three ex-Pennsylvania GP9s that were sold as surplus from Conrail. Of the three GP7s, numbered 7000, 7007, and 7010, only the first of the three saw extensive service as a switcher for Hoboken and Elizabethport, while the other two Jeeps remained in Penn Central colors and were given NJT stencils but were never reported to be in service before being scrapped. Even though 7000 initially remained in its Conrail blue, the engine eventually received NJT patches on its front and side, just before being retired and returned to its original Pennsy appearance on the Cape May Reading Seashore Line's Taurus Road and keeping its original number throughout its entire service life. F40PHR As yet another example of a slightly different class that blends in with a more common class, this entry refers to a handful of former Amtrak F40PHRs that were briefly leased in 2003 and sold back just two years later. Upon the retirement of several Amtrak F40PHRs, or F40s built from SDP40F parts, many of these surplus engines were purchased by Railworld Leasing in the early 2000s, where they were later sold to various transit agencies, freight railroads, and tourist railroads who needed HEP-equipped engines. Almost identical to their more common F40PH-2 CATs, with the primary difference including different ditch lights and a top red headlight, NJT purchased a total of six engines including numbers 270, 274, 293, 302, 311, and 400. Although, photos of these F40 leasers in service are very scarce, as they only ran on the railroad for about two years before being sold to various other leasing and commuter agencies. New Jersey Transit Comet 1s on Metrolink Due to high gas prices possibly caused by the 2008 recession, Metrolink saw a spike in ridership and desperately needed more cars, especially since their order of Hyundai Road and Buy levels wasn't ready yet. In response, Metrolink continued their ongoing practice of leasing a bunch of passenger and cab cars from almost everywhere on the west coast, and in this case, recently retired NJT Comet 1s, in addition to ex-NJT Comet 1s from UTA in Salt Lake City. Most Comet 1 coaches were placed directly behind the lead engine, although it's unlikely that any Metrolink sets were made up entirely of Comet 1s, nor that the Comet 1 cab cars led any sets. Upon the arrival of the new buy levels, 8 Comet 1 cabs were placed in the storage in Paris, California until 2020, where they were thankfully preserved by the Southern California Railway Museum thus leaving these New Jersey legends in an unlikely retirement home. Conrail Engines on NJ Dot Similar to the chassis system loaning their diesels to Mark, since it was operated by the freight railroad at the time, Conrail GP38s would occasionally be placed on the front of NJ Dot trains whenever NJ Dot was short on power, mostly because Conrail owned the equipment that NJ Dot operated. This appeared to be especially prevalent on XCNJ commuter service at Phillipsburg, since this appears to be the only branch where it has happened although it wouldn't be surprising if similar Conrail engines would be leased on other lines if NJDOT or other commuter agencies were short on power for the time being. Metro-North leased NJDOT E8s Almost immediately after starting service, the newly independent Metro-North found itself in a power shortage due to the retirement of the NYCP motors. To compensate, Metro-North immediately disregarded the no-diesel laws to Grand Central and leased 7 geb 23 7s from Conrail and 5 E8s three from NJT, and two from Amtrak, and ran them right into Grand Central Terminal, thus defying the station's anti-diesel policy for the first time in its history. Despite being the only six-axle power in the railroad's history, the five E8s were returned to their respective owners after a few months in service, with four of the five E8s being preserved, while the seven B23s were kept by the railroad and were repainted, as they were eventually downgraded to work service and sold off to various railroads in the late 90s. Erie E-Unit Excursions in partnership with the United Railroad Historic Society in New Jersey, or URHS, NJT would host several excursions with the two repainted Erie E8s, mostly with NJT Comets, and often with other URHS private cars on one or two ends of the train. 
These excursions lasted between 1990 and 2005, as these icons could be found anywhere ranging from the Whippany Railway Museum, running shuttles, to places as far as Honesdale, Hawley, and Lacka Watson, Pennsylvania, with at least three quarters of the contents including NJT or Metro-North coaches. Today, the two E-units are stored with the rest of the URHS collection at Boonton, New Jersey, although one of the two E-units, namely 835, was also one of the five E-8s that Metro-North leased for service in the Grand Central in the previous century, while still in its NJ dot livery as number 4248. NJT West Trenton Line Technically, NJ dot briefly hosted a West Trenton to Newark shuttle between 1981 and 83 when the service was still under Conrail, while the Crusaders still continued from Philadelphia Reading Terminal to Newark using SEPTA RDCs until 1983. But since 2007, NJT has been looking into restoring service on the former Reading Main Line with a West Trenton line of their own, or essentially extending the Raritan Valley line from Bridgewater to West Trenton. The route runs along the currently single-tracked CSX Intermodal Main Line, and also proposes new stops at I-295 in Hillsboro, as well as a new yard at West Trenton, although CSX has been hesitant to allow such service to run on their already congested Main Line, as this project is still proposed by NJT, but no funding for the proposal has been secured to the state. NJDOT Cape May and Ocean City Branches In addition to PRSL's main line between Camden and Atlantic City, NJDOT also continued muter services with but already ceased to two of South Jersey's other largest towns, Ocean City and Cape May. Although, construction of the Patco speed line on top of the PRSL main line truncated all PRSL commuter service at Lindenwolf, and this ultimately resulted in an unpopular transfer from a low ridership line to a subway which ultimately resulted in all three of the South Jersey branches being discontinued in 1981, thus being the only NJDOT branches to be discontinued in their entirety. Even though service to Atlantic City would soon be restored from Philadelphia via the Delaware Bridge due to the popularity of Newlyville casinos, service to Ocean City and Cape May have yet to return, with various bus routes replacing rail service between Camden and these two towns. Although, the line between Winslow Junction and Cape May is almost entirely intact, the Conrail shared assets and the Cape May Seashore Lines Torch Railroad, while the branch of Ocean City has since been abandoned, with no official plans to restore rail service to either of these two towns. Passaic Bergen Hudson Transit Project As another project that's been on and off over the years, this one seems to be much more unique and much less certainty as to what it's supposed to be, as this project proposes running past rail service on New York, Susquehanna, and Western trackage between Hawthorne and Tunnel Avenue where it would interchange with the Hudson Bergen light rail. The project was initially considered as a commuter rail line, then as a light rail service, and now a DMU service similar to River Line between Trenton and Camden, which brings this project into a gray area of whether it's considered commuter rail or rapid transit. Like the last project, it's currently being considered by NJT, likely a lot more than the West Trenton line, but there doesn't seem to be as many solid plans for this line as of now, likely in order to focus on higher priorities to projects such as the Camden the Glass World project. Newark Penn Station Zodiac Signs Similar to Grand Central's iconic ceiling, the Art Deco ceiling of NJT's Newark Penn Station has connections to the cosmos through a mixture of Zodiac signs and modern elements, with various transportation feats such as a covered wagon and electric locomotive being developed into the ornaments. Meanwhile, the ceiling is covered with blue Pastavino tiles in a herringbone pattern directed by undulating brass lines embedded into the tile as the twist away from the modern architectural style can be found in the zodiac symbols that encircle each of the four globe chandeliers. The blue ceiling represents the sky, the four globe chandeliers could be interpreted as the sun or moon and or the four seasons, and the zodiac symbols connect Earth and the cosmos. NJT Monmouth Park Branch Continuing an ongoing tradition from the CNJ, express trains would be held from Hoboken to Monmouth Park Racetrack with a small spur from the North Jersey coastline right to the grandstand of the racetrack. Said express trains were called the Pony Express, and usually ran with one or two diesels, sometimes back to back, as they would pull into a four-track stub station for multiple trains to pull into. Trains would be sent to these sidings during race days until 2005, when service was shifted to the much smaller present-day Monmouth Park station on the electrified North Jersey coastline, with the Pony Express being discontinued along with the sidings becoming abandoned. NJT Observation Car Sometimes, a commuter rail may roster a private car or two for inspections or special events, but NJT took this a step further and had their observation car in revenue service 
before becoming a special events car, as it could be seen all throughout the system over the years. NJT1 started service as one of four observation cars for the famous Blue Comet between Jersey City and Atlantic City. Then it was included on CNJ commuter service between Newark and Phillipsburg. Then it was purchased by NJT, where it made its last revenue run in the late 70s. Since then, it was painted into NJT's disco stripe livery as it was used as an inspection car, but also attended various excursions until it was retired in 1993 and was restored to its original Blue Comet appearance at the Whippany Railway Museum. EMD NJT Dual Mode Proposal Usually when a railroad announces a request for a proposal, or RFP, for a new rolling stock procurement, multiple manufacturers usually submit a proposal that meets the needs of the railroad. In this case, during the mid-2000s, NJT needed a dual mode engine that could run on both diesel and overhead fires to replace much of their diesel fleet and to connect more diesel branches with one-seat rides in the Penn Station. As Bombardier submitted their ALP45, EMD also submitted their response to NJT's proposal by providing a dual-mode version of their DM30AC on the LIRR, this time with Panagraphs instead of third-rail shoes. Although, EMD's reputation was in a bit of a slump at the time due to multiple mechanical issues with the DE and DM30ACs that were sold to the LIRR, while the Bombardier had a much more reliable reputation with the success of the ALP46, so Bombardier ultimately won the contract with the more reliable ALP45. EMD F70PH About a decade before submitting their dual-mode engine proposal, EMD was in the midst of designing a new line of passenger engines in collaboration with Siemens that utilized recent findings in AC traction power after testing the F69PHAC, as this new engine was supposedly going to be called the F70PH. In the case of this iceberg, EMD tried to sell these models to NGT, but none of the routes that EMD advertised the F72 ended up purchasing the model likely due to EMD still trying to recover from the commercial failure of the SD50 10 years prior, which ultimately drove more railroads to buy models from GE. In the case of NJT, they simply purchased rebuilt EMDs, since it was cheaper to rebuild than purchase brand new. Colorado Railcar DMU Test On the topic of trying to sell new trains across the country and resulting in few sales, another promising model being developed at the turn of the century was a single-level DMU from the newly established Colorado Railcar, which is making its way across the country to showcase its capabilities in revenue service to customers. Interestingly, the demonstrator DMU was tried on the Princeton Dinky with a Comet 5 cab car, thus being the only time a cab car has been used on the branch, possibly suggesting to de-electrify the branch, where it only ran for a few days in 2004 before moving to the next railroad. Even though the rail car rode well and provided panoramic views, NGT never made any purchases for any equipment from Colorado Railcar, this company went out of business four years later due to financial difficulties, thus crushing hope of a great concept. MP20Bs are rebuilt from GP40 FHs. Despite their drastic difference in appearance, all five of NJT's MPI MP20B switchers were rebuilt from surplus GP40 FH-2s, all of which in chronological order, as NJT4130 through 4134 re-emerged as NJT1001 through 1005. This rebuild was likely completed right around the time where GP40FHs were considered surplus, hence why they were sent to Motive Power Industries for rebuilding in chronological order, starting with the first GP40FH to exist, namely 4130, as these five engines can be seen around the NJT system on various switching and MOW duties. In a way, it's somewhat fitting that the GP40FHs out of all engines would be chosen by this rebuild program, as these engines themselves were heavily rebuilt from standard GP40 freight engines with the addition of an F45 cow body, as they are also the only ones of their kind that would ultimately end up staying on the roster, though barely recognizable from their previous form. NJT High Railer Fire Truck Different railroads have all sorts of high railers or vehicles that have pop-up rail wheels that allows them to travel on the roads and rails. Usually, these consist of pickup trucks or semis that have to travel from a maintenance facility to a track work site, but none are more unconventional than NJT's High Railer Heavy Rescue Unit. Although it has the same shape of a fire truck, hence the name of the entry, this massive vehicle is numbered ESU-197, or Emergency Service Unit, as it's used for impact zones where the surrounding area is particularly unsafe, thus being a unique addition to a wide fleet of vehicles designed to keep the railroad safe. NJ dot MP54s. According to the Wikipedia page for the MP54, the units powered by overhead wires, designated as PRR, 
are listed as being in service until 1981, most likely on their respective commuter routes under their respective state agencies. Since this iceberg is covering entries from predecessor state entries, this would technically mean that NJDOT, Conrail, and Mark rostered MP54s as inherited equipment for commuter service, even if they weren't repainted into their respective liveries. It's just one of those entries where it's not initiative for a state agency, or in SEPTA, to roster this type of rail card due to lack of footage or anything else that made it distinct during that era, but by timing, it turns out that they were on the roster. NJDOT U-34s in freight service Since the U-34s were heavily inspired from the various U-boats from GE, with one of the U-34s literally being rebuilt from a U-30C, it should come as no surprise that the Erie Lackawanna borrowed these freight engines in disguise on the weekends, as long as they were returned in time for the Monday rush hour. It's assumed that this practice was continued until the formation of Conrail a few years later, but most of the Yale's power was deemed surplus, which defeated the need to borrow any engines for that matter, as the U-34s later be owned completely by NJDOT and later NJT until their retirement in 1994. Lawrence Harbor Station This was basically an infill station proposed to serve the small residential region between South Amboy and Aberdeen Matawan, which was proposed several times over the past few decades, but was quietly forgotten about. Even though almost no renderings of the station can be found online, the proposal was initially brought up in the 80s, with no progress being made until 2001, with further discussions and renderings, as well as a rename to Metro Park South in 2008, where the plan was conditionally accepted and was never brought up again. Based on the rename, it could be possible that the station tried to connect another one of the railroad's busiest lines to the Garden State Parkway, where the park and ride connection of stores, but having two Metro Parks could lead to some confusion as no discussion of this station has been made in over 15 years, likely due to its close proximity to Aberdeen Matawan. Stations opened under Conrail Most stations along the commuter rail system were originally opened by one of many predecessor railroads, with some first incarnations of the station dating back to well over a century old. Other stations, however, are brand new and designed by the present-day commuter railroad, while others are just before the present-day owners, hence the purpose of the century, to highlight the handful of stations that were newly built while under Conrail's jurisdiction. Again, this highlights the theme of non-intuitive assumptions about passenger rail in the region, as not a lot of people would expect Conrail, a freight railroad by definition, to design their own commuter rail stations in cooperation with the respective state agencies. But all that said, during the seven years of Conrail's direct experience in passenger rail on NJT, they opened a grand total of two stations, Bay Street on NJT's Montclair, now Montclair Bouton Branch in 1981, and the now abandoned Harmon Cove, on NJT's Bergen County Line in 1978. NJT Non-Passenger Lines Technically, the century refers to two different aspects of NJT's operation, one equipment-based and one ROW-based. The first of the two highlights how several Morristown and Erie engines have been borrowed by NJT over the years, as well as how NJT GP40s are occasionally leased to the Morristown and Erie near the Montclair Boonton Line, and in more recent times, the other short lines including the Middletown of New Jersey near the Port Jervis branch and the Southern Railroad in New Jersey near the Atlantic City branch. The second, much lesser known aspect is that NJT owns several non passenger rail lines that are either abandoned or leased to other local freight operators, as most of these lines were inherited by NJT upon their inception in 1979. Abandoned lines include the Lackawanna's Harrison to Kingland connection, a segment of the CNJ Blue Comet from Woodman Sea to Winslow Junction, PRSL's Ocean City Ranch to Palmero, and its CNJ branch from Freehold to Matawan. Notable segments that still see freight use are Norfolk Southern between Highbridge and Bloomsbury, Conrail and Delaware Railroad and River between Red Bank and Woodman Sea, and Conrail and Cape May Riding Seashore Lines between Winslow Junction and Cape May. The state of New Jersey owns Suffern Station and Yard. Art and Penn Station, the main line, Bergen County, and Pasquick Valley lines are the only lines whose terminus stations are located in New York State instead of New Jersey, as Suffern Station and Yard, served by the first two of the three lines mentioned, is located just north of the New York State border. But since NJT owns the station and yard at the terminus station, and considering that NJT is controlled by the New Jersey state government, this technically means that NJT, and by extension the state of New Jersey itself, owns property in the state of New York. Although, Metro North technically owns the tracks that the yard is on, since Metro North is contracted to operate all commuter services on the New York side of the Port Jervis line, so the tracks are owned by Metro North, while the Suffern Yard is operated by New Jersey Transit. Yet according to Railguide, 
NJT does own all the trackage on the New York side of the Pasquet Valley line, so technically they own some aspect of land there too. Montclair Boonton Line to Pompton and Phillipsburg. Two restoration proposals, one on each predecessor railroad. Seeing that the present day Montclair Boonton Line is comprised of the former Erie Railroad and Lackawanna Railroad branch, it's more than fitting that these little discussed proposals focus on restoring service on a former Erie branch and a former Lackawanna branch along the line. The first of these two restores most of the Erie's New York and Greenwood Lake service up to Pompton, with the original line continuing further north to Sterling Forest, New York, although this proposal seems less likely due to most of the line being converted into a trail. The second of the two seems much more plausible, as the Phillipsburg extension would simply involve extending service Pack Hackettstown on former Lackawanna trackage to Phillipsburg where it would meet up nicely with a proposed RVL extension. Even though this could quite possibly be one of the easiest service expansions on the NJT system, discussion of this extension seems to be overshadowed by the nearby Lackawanna cutoff restoration to Scranton. Led Zeppelin GP40P Once again using the NJ. Commuter Services count rule to my advantage, I'm able to include the only music-related entry of the iceberg, and it's a very epic one at that. Just after being acquired by NJDOT and being renumbered to 4106, one of NJDOT's GP40Ps would have the words Led Zepp written on this side, as a tribute to the rock band Led Zeppelin, which was fittingly applied to the engine when the band was on tour in the US in 1977. This was most likely an unofficial spray paint by a few employees who happened to like the band, seeing that it is rather hastily applied on top of the CNJ lettering, although this engine, 4106, would later become the CNJ Heritage Unit for NJT in 2019, and would get its own episode of Remarkable Engines. NTSB 210 During the late 70s, NJDOT purchased several second-hand E8s in order to supplement the worn-out Penn Central E8s on North Jersey Coastline commuter service between South Amboy and Bayhead, with some E-units being repainted into the iconic Bluebird livery, while others, notably the Southern E8s, remained in their previous livery. But somehow, of the several E8s that were brought into New Jersey to help with the slight power shortage, NJDOT somehow managed to obtain a FRA-owned E8, namely NTSB, or DOT-210, which had the words Transportation Safety Institute on its side, meaning that the engine was owned by the U.S. Department of Transportation and was from the DOT's Pueblo, Colorado testing facility. Despite going to New Jersey, it was only recently purchased by the U.S. DOT as it was retired from Amtrak in 1975 thus making it one of a handful of E-units to run on Amtrak for NJDOT, as 210 along with the other E-units were eventually retired by the mid to late 80s, as 210 is currently stored at the West Virginia Railroad Museum in Bellington, mostly still in its unique DOT livery. NJT E-44 Upon the discontinuance of electric freight service by Conrail in 1981, this left a bunch of not-too-old E-44s up for sale, so NJT jumped on the opportunity to immediately purchase eight of them from Conrail and gave them NJT stencils, but were never repainted into NJT colors. Although these freight engines were intended to replace the iconic GG1s in passenger service, the deal was ultimately called off due to concerns with leaks of PCB containing coolants from their transformers. This ultimately led to NJT purchasing extra Amtrak E60s and later brand new ALP44s for this very purpose, while the 8 E44s were sold to Amtrak for maintenance service where they were rarely seen, with only one E44 being preserved to this day. Mark AEM7s on NJT Speaking of GG1 replacements, NJT briefly trialed a Mark AEM7 on some of their electric routes, as the problems from the E60 that plagued Amtrak were also plaguing NJT, so a more reliable electric engine was needed. NJT was most likely going to purchase an AEM7 along with Mark and Septa, but unfortunately NJT showed interest just a little too late, since EMD stopped production of the AEM7 in 1987 just one year before the Mark AEM7s were trialed on NJT. With the successful test runs of the basis engine, this resulted in ABB creating a similar electric engine known as the ALP44, which served NJT until the late 2000s and they were replaced by the more reliable ALP46. Ski Train For a few weekends during the winter of 1990, NJT and New York, Susquehanna, and Western jointly operated a ski train service from Hoboken to Vernon, New Jersey with the consists including a recently restored DNH boxcar for transporting skis, the pasture cars including a series of private cars owned by NYSW. Since the excursion was jointly operated by the Susquehanna, most of the run was on NYSW trackage between North Bergen and Sparta Junction, 
as well as the recently purchased former Lehigh and Hudson River Main Line to Vernon, thus making it one of the first major trains to use the new mileage. Although, this marks the last time any passenger service ran on the NYSW Main Line, or to Vernon, New Jersey, as unlike other passenger railroads, the NJT Ski Train was a one-time excursion run instead of an annual service. Easter Bunny Excursion Speaking of excursions that are considered normal on other railroads, but NJT barely does them, NJT also worked with the Susquehanna again with a handful of Easter and Christmas trains, this time a more local trackage on the Bergen County line between Hoboken and Glenrock. In the case of this entry, Consist included soon-to-be Heritage Unit NJT4109 with a handful of NYSW X Long Island Railroad P72s and an RDC behind NJT GP40 number 4200. These two Easter trains were spotted in 2004 and 2005, while a Christmas train from 2003 would also feature coaches from the Adirondack Scenic Railroad. All these NYSW coaches have since been sold to the Delaware River Railroad Excursions, where they continue to operate in tourist service out of Phillipsburg, not too far away from NJT trackage, in case if NJT would ever need them again. Lehigh Limited 2013 Speaking of NJT excursions near Phillipsburg, this particular excursion was held between Hoboken and Bethlehem to celebrate the 110th anniversary of the Morristown Erie Railroad along former Lackawanna Main Line. Amidst the 16-car-long train, with mostly private cars, are three Comet 5 cars, with an NJT P40DC as the third engine in the contest to provide head and power for the coaches, which is why this particular excursion is included in the iceberg, since it involves at least a handful of regular NJT equipment on rare mileage. NKP 765 and CNO 614 on NJT. The first of these two barely made the iceberg since the only way NJT was involved was when a single GP40P towed Nickel Plate Road 765 after its NRHS convention run from Hoboken to Fort Jervis in 1988, so this way the train could be brought back to Hoboken with ME Alcos instead of having to turn to 765 around. Although, this 4109 that's towing the famous 765 is not the same CNJ Heritage unit that we know today as this GP40P would later be rebuilt and renumbered 4107. The much more well-known of the two excursions occurred eight years later in 1996, as Chesapeake and Ohio No. 614 pulled the Erie Limited between Hoboken and Port Jervis, this time with two-thirds of the consists including NJT Comet 1s. NYSW 142 was even placed on the lead near Port Jervis, although a faulty check valve on 614's auxiliary tender resulted in the train to be towed by NJT GP40 some of the return trips, but the excursions otherwise ran without too many mishaps, as this would ultimately be 614's last public excursion under steam as of when this video was made. Bergen Shore Express The northern and southern regions of NJT have barely been connected to each other since all commuter routes stem towards Manhattan and Hoboken, since their primary purpose is to transport commuters going to and from work in the city. But one of NJT's most popular tourist lines is the North Jersey coastline, and anyone who wants to take the train from the northern region of the system has to make a series of transfers, since the Caucus Junction wasn't built yet. Enter the Bergen Shore Express, a once-daily, weekends-only summer train that ran from Suffern along the main line, and then used the NYSW freight connection to run non-stop all the way to Long Branch, in addition to all the other Jersey Shore towns along the line, thus being one of a few trains in history that didn't stop at Newark, and started and ended in New Jersey without stopping at Penn or Hoboken. Despite the highly unorthodox routing of this special, the train only ran for three summers starting in 1986, as operations proved to be difficult due to crew shortages, complicated switching procedures, and not knowing how crowded any given train could be, with current routes to go from the northern side of NJT to the NJCL now being made possible by a simple transfer at Secaucus Junction. Proposed Amtrak Stop at Hamilton, New Jersey This is referring to an interesting detail in the 1998 NJT map, in which a station with a box and dot indicates a transfer to Amtrak. Not only was this initially indicated for the then new Hamilton station, possibly to promote the new station's opening, but it also listed Hoboken as an Amtrak accessible stop, even though Amtrak never explicitly stated any plans to stop at Hoboken or Hamilton. Considering that Hamilton is less than four miles away from Trenton, Amtrak might have considered the distance between the stations too short to stop again, as an extra stop would ultimately slow their services. Access to the region's core Starting in the late 90s, congestion of NJT and Amtrak services between Penn Station and New Jersey was becoming evident, and several discussions about adding a set of new Hudson River tunnels along with a loop at Secaucus 
became common among transit planners and engineers. In addition to the present-day incarnation of the Gateway program, NJT's version of the plan, called Access to the Region's Core, prioritized constructing a new, deeper segment of Penn Station to handle extra trains just north of the existing station, in a station layout very similar to LIRR's East Side Access, with some alternatives even proposing NJT service to expand the Grand Central Terminal, either to the lower level or Grand Central Madison. Despite positive feedback and construction set to start on tunneling on the Jersey side, the project was abruptly cancelled in 2010, due to concerns of the project going over budget and resulting in higher taxes for New Jersey residents, with the only aspect of this plan that's still under further development being the two new Hudson River tunnels. This plan also proposed a famous 7 train extension to New Jersey as an alternative to NJT service to Grand Central. And there are also proposals from a group named Real Transit to connect Hoboken to a Manhattan terminal on 14th Street named Hudson Terminal with a heavy rail tunnel. Although a tunnel from Hoboken to Manhattan does not seem to be part of any of the official proposals from any transit agency. Comet 1 Bar Cars In the face of competition from automobiles and a transfer at Hoboken to the city, commuter rail agencies had to think of modern and creative ways to attract customers to the rails in order to keep afloat. So, in addition to purchasing passenger variants of freight engines, NJDOT purchased brand new state of the art Comet 1 coaches and cab cars that would set the standard for all single level NJT equipment, and some of these coaches even included snack bars and were designated accordingly. Although there aren't many photos of the interiors, only a small number of these snack bars were built, as they lasted well into the 80s and were used on various NJT commuter runs, thus serving as a rare addition of food and drink service on an otherwise standard commuter railroad. It's also worth noting that there were a handful of inherited coaches that were converted into snack cars for NJT, most notably for their North Jersey coastline, but they also weren't photographed too often and they required steam heating rather than head-end power or electricity. Alstom U34s On the topic of EL's NJ dot commuter trains, a total of 19 U34CHs were sold to Conrail upon their retirement from NJT in 1996, where they were all eventually sold to GEC Alstom, who used them for leaser service in Mexico. Upon this purchase, several engines were painted in the Alstom leasing livery, with some engines being returned to the US and scrapped over time. Although the total number of U34s in existence in Mexico doesn't seem to be a clear answer, mostly due to the privatization of NJM right as the U34s were brought to Mexico. Even though 3372 is reported as the only surviving U34 from the URHS collection, there is still a slight chance that at least one of these engines is either stored or still working somewhere in Mexico or elsewhere in Central America, as many GEU boats and B-23s can still be found in operating service in Mexico to this day. AOP-45 130mph Test Train In the early morning hours of October 28, 2015, the Northeast Corridor saw one of the greatest test trains from both Amtrak and NJT. Thanks to various infrastructure upgrades on the NEC, Amtrak was looking to recertify their fuel liner sleepers for 125 miles per hour, and it just so happened that NJT was also looking to certify their ALP 45s for 125 at the same time. So instead of running two separate trains with different equipment, the two railroads decided to merge their equipment on one test train, which included an ALP 45 on each end two viewliner sleepers, a viewliner baggage in the middle, and fleet coaches and cafes, and even two horizon coaches to meet the axle requirements. There were also reports of this test train running into Maryland, which marks the first time an ALP-45 not only pulled Amtrak equipment, but also ran south to Philadelphia. But despite this legendary test run for successful 125 mph per hour certification going up to 130, NJT trains are still limited to 100 mph per hour, as the time savings between stations when traveling at 125 are seen as minimal by comparison. Secaucus Junction Original Name During the planning stages of the proposed transfer station, Secaucus Junction was originally going to be named Allied Junction, based on the real estate firm named Allied that built billboards on railroad and highway right-of-ways and recommended the potential of a transfer station. Also showcased in early renderings is a much longer headhouse along with several TODs just outside the station. Although this development project was ultimately scrapped, as it would bring too much traffic to the new developments, as developers wanted to focus on making Secaucus Junction as simply a transfer station instead of a TOD. Although part of the Allied name was incorporated into the general region, as just outside Secaucus Junction on the Northeast Corridor is Allied Interlocking. New Jersey Devils Hoboken Station Arena 
1999, the New Jersey Devils hockey team proposed to build a new arena on top of Hoboken Terminal for better access to NJT, Pass, and Ferries on the Hudson waterfront. Although this thankfully would have kept the station house intact and not demolished like Penn Station. In addition to almost 19,000 seat arena, the proposed complex would include a 20 screen multiplex theater, retail stores, theme restaurants, and waterfront parks thus being one of a handful of recent TLD developments that did not include housing. Although, plans for this massive redevelopment of Hoboken were cancelled as the New Jersey Devils moved to the Prudential Center in Newark, not too far away from Newark Penn Station, but didn't result in too many other amenities being built around the same arena. Staruka House Special, 1983 Sometimes, if you're in a good mood or just reached a massive milestone, it's a good idea to do something special for the sake of celebrating and having a good time and this fan trip is no different. As one of NJT's first excursions as an independent commuter railroad on November 13, 1983, two freshly repainted U-34s led a string of Comet 1s along the former Erie Main Line past Port Jervis and over rare mileage to the Staruka House in Susquehanna, Pennsylvania, also a popular rail finding spot at the time, simply for the sake of enjoying the fall foliage. Although not too much is known about this particular fan trip, the Staruka House would later house four NJT Comet 1s that were damaged during the freight move, with some of those cars possibly being on that very excursion, as well as a Belgian coffee pot engine from Steamtown that would later get its own episode of Remarkable Engines. Warwick Middletown Limited Excursion, 1985 Less than two years later, NJT hosted an even more impressive and rare fan trip running along even more rare mileage, and this time with foreign power leading the train. On April 28, 1985, the Lackawanna Valley Short Line placed their leased U30B number 901 in front of an almost new NJT F40PH-2 Cat as they pulled 10 Comets in a cab car from Hoboken to Middletown along the former New York, Ontario and Western Main Line, as well as Warwick along the former Lehigh and Hudson River Main Line. The lead engine was fittingly placed in a New York, Ontario and Western livery to pay tribute to the railroad that once owned a small segment of track to Middletown which just so happened to be one of the few miles of the railroad that's not abandoned, with NJT not offering excursion service on either former railroad's trackage again since, with the exception of the 1990 ski train to Vernon. NJT X Erie Stillwell Coaches Even though NJ Dot continued to operate Erie Stillwell Coaches inherited from EL, they were never repainted due to their old age, as they were soon retired by Comet 1s throughout the 70s. But somehow, a single Erie Stillwell coach namely number 2708, not only made it in the NJT, but was also repainted with the railroad's iconic disco stripes as it was used as a lunch car with cafeteria tables for NJT employees at Hoboken during the 80s, but was never used on any revenue pasture trains for NJT. The car was last seen in 1989 with a handful of other legacy pasture cars as part of a URHS equipment move, but its current whereabouts are unknown, as no reports of car 2708 have surfaced since its last appearance but hopefully it's preserved somewhere along with a handful of other preserved Stillwell coaches. Home-built Elizabethport Shop Switcher Few entries on this massive iceberg have been shrouded in more mystery than this custom-built shop switcher, or bug, at the once famous Elizabethport shops. Like many shop bugs, this thing was mostly used to move larger engines from one part of the shop to another, for various tests and repairs, as it wasn't even given a number. Since this shop was once owned by the CNJ, it's assumed that the CNJ put this thing together with spare parts, as it was transferred to Conrail and then NJT, as even this little known shop bug was given iconic NJT disco stripes. Miraculously, this shop bug was quickly swooped up after Elizabeth Port shops shut down in the late 80s, as the shop bug can currently be found at the Reading Railroad Heritage Museum in Hamburg, Pennsylvania, a long way from its former home. DE 40,000 BB According to the Diesel Shop website, the alternative name that's given for the Alstom PL42AC is the DE40000BB, even though the alternative class name is not provided anywhere else online. Considering that this class was constructed by both EMD and Alstom, thus being one of a handful of American engine classes that have two different manufacturers, the engine likely had two different class names given by the two builders. On the American side from EMD, PL denotes pasture locomotive, 42 for 4200 horsepower, and AC for alternating current traction power, but on the French side from Alstom, DE denotes diesel electric, BB denotes the B-B wheel arrangement, but I'm not sure as to what the 40,000 could denote, 
as the SNCF numbering system reserves the 40,000 series to DC powered quadruple voltage electric locomotives, which this engine most certainly is not. NJT and Disney Pixar Metro In 2022, concept art of a cancelled Disney Pixar movie named Metro was leaked online and showcased various scenes in the movie in the same animation style as a popular Cars franchise that would have centered around the New York City subway R160 and its fast-paced adventures around the city. In addition to the subway system, the movie would be showcasing various heavy rail locations in the greater New York region along with various engines that are entirely accurate to their real-life counterparts, a very rare feat when it comes to railroad representation in the media nowadays. One of these locations includes what appears to be just outside of Hoboken Terminal, as several ALP-46s and a GP-40 look down on the R-160 as it passes by on what could be the Pats subway, thus starting one of several scenes where the subway goes on a series of adventures outside of city limits. Penn Station Coal Delivery Remnant This is kind of pushing the boundaries of what's considered eligible for the iceberg, but its story is so interesting that I just had to include it, because it basically confirms that Penn Station, New York once saw revenue freight. You heard that right. Penn Station saw revenue freight on a daily basis. During the early days of Penn Station, while the Pennsy was using third rail power DD1s, a single coal car would be attached to passenger trains where it would pull into present day track 1, and the coal car would be unloaded to feed the steam heaters of Penn Station. Although footage of this unloading sequence, or any freight cars behind Penn DD1s, has yet to surface online. Even though the operation was eventually discontinued at some point, most of the remnants of the coal unloader are still visible on track 1 which is almost exclusively served by NJT, hence why I included it on the NJT iceberg. That, and I just wanted to find a way to share this incredibly cool story about Penn seeing mixed or revenue freight trains. NJT has the oldest active engine in revenue pasture service. Some engines are so good that they simply get refurbished instead of being fully replaced, and no engine class represents this scenario better than NJT's expansive fleet of rebuilt GP40s many of which were purchased from freight railroads decades ago, and they're still running strong to this day. As a matter of fact, it's because of this continuous rebuilding of their GP40s that NJT actually rosters the oldest operating locomotive in revenue pasture service in the entire United States. And that honor goes to GP40PH-2 number 4207, originally built as New York Central number 3005 in October of 1965 as it still continues to run on several passenger trains out of Hoboken on a daily basis. Honorable mentions go to sister engines 4202 and 4215, as they were built as New York Central 3006 and 3009 respectively, so they were built immediately after 3005 and performed the same duties as 4206, as they show no signs of slowing down anytime soon. And on that note, we finally reached the end of the NJT commuter rail iceberg. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and for sticking with me to the end, as this took months to put together, and I'd like to thank many of you for providing info to make this project possible. Since this was split up from a much larger project, most of the material for the other commuter railroads is already gathered, so be sure to be on the lookout for the next iceberg on the next commuter railroad sometime soon. Are there any little known fun facts about these roads that I forgot to include in this video? Feel free to mention them in the comments. Thank you again for watching. Credit for all the photos used go to their respective photographers, and if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more. Have a good day.